So we're going to move now to our next presentation, which seems completely different. And, but I think we can also find a thread of, of commonality here. We're going to move from Dr. Hester and the incredibly complicated field of law, field of law to another subject, one that is just as deeply ingrained in our cultural history, superheroes. A subject that perhaps none of us expect to connect to ideas of social justice, gender stereotypes, how we treat each other as human beings. But our next presenters are going to do exactly that. They are going to take us into a world that not many of us give more than a passing thought to as we go to see the new Marvel movie or buy the new comic books when they come out. We're going to hear about superheroes the depiction of gender that is embedded within that world and the damage that those portrayals can, um, can create. So our presenters tonight are Dr. Chris Garneau, as, uh, Assistant Professor of Sociology here at USAO, and Preston Lowe, who is a sociology major about to graduate, correct? Um, and I think you will see after this presentation why we're all so proud to claim Preston as one of our soon-to-be graduates. So. Guys. So uh, thanks again for coming. I am Dr. Garneau. Uh, I'm the Assistant Professor of Sociology here at USAO. And um, I'm going to begin, uh, the, I guess, this conversation and I'll let Preston finish up. So what I want to start with is kind of this basic idea that we all kind of take this, this thing called gender for granted. So gender is what we call a social construct. By social construct, meaning that it's something that societies or our society has created, but that it doesn't actually exist the way that we think it does. So a lot of times we tend to confuse two different concepts, sex and gender. Sex is biological, it's whether you have an X or a Y chromosome. Um, there are six different sexes, there aren't just two. Um, and there are an infinite number of genders. Gender is an idea about, uh, a gender that, uh, excuse me, an idea that is linked to biological sex but really is expressed through behaviors, through choices, through preferences, these types of things. So what I want to talk to, talk to you about tonight is gender discrimination through the media. We're specifically going to talk about comic books, but I do want to talk about the importance of the media in general. So one of the, um, one of the observations of many social theorists is that, gen is that gender, as well as many other social issues, are reflected through the media, because the media, in a lot of ways, is a reflection of society. So when I say media, we're covering a huge range of platforms. This could be the television news, but it could also be newspapers. It can be internet websites. It can be the music that we listen to, the art that we appreciate. This is all media, and it's all using society as a looking glass to kind of reflect back to us what we look like, which has been going on for a long time. So if you wanted to look at network television, we can go all the way back to the beginning and look at shows like Leave it to Beaver that have very traditional types of views of women and men and roles in the household. So women as caretakers and men as providers. We can fast forward a few years um, and we see social progress happening in our society which is then reflected in the media. Uh, there is a huge deal made out of Murphy Brown which is a show that started in the late 1980s that portrayed a single working mother. Fast forward to today in 2016, we have television shows such as Modern Family, which exemplify uh, things as same-sex marriage as well as interracial marriage. So as society changes, the media changes to kind of match up what we're doing um, within our society. So what ends up happening in a lot of cases is that some of the aspects of society aren't just reflected back to us, but they are accentuated and amplified. So for example, this idea that women are caretakers and that men are providers. What sometimes happens is there's a feedback loop that occurs where we have this societal trend, the media picks up on it, and it sends back this amplified, and we might even want to say distorted. Um, there's a little bit of signal there, but it's kind of this distorted view of what society looks like. So when we talk about gender, it's a self-perpetuating cycle that a lot of times um, leaves us feeling like we are caught inside the uh, caught inside uh, the trees where we can't exactly see the forest. And that's why gender seems to be so natural, even though we know that gender is completely made up. It is something that, uh, that, that seems like it's innate, but it's actually something that we're socialized to believe and to understand. 
So what we want to do today is focus on the media, but specifically within comic books, to um, kind of demonstrate these ideas. And I want to focus on one, uh, one area specifically, or one major theory dealing with gender discrimination. So uh, tonight, I'm going to deal with hegemonic masculinity. So any Mad Men fans in here? I don't know, maybe a few. All right, hegemonic masculinity. The term uh, hegemony, or hegemonic, is basically the idea of domination. So if we're talking about hegemonic masculinity, we're talking about a theory that was created by Raywin Connell, which states that the masculine is the dominant gender expression in our society. Hegemonic meaning it is dominant. So that means we give status or higher status to those things that are masculine and perhaps lower status to those things that are feminine. So by gender expression, I mean several different components. So it could be style of dress, uh, which might be a suit, right? Um, if we talk about gender expression dealing with our mannerisms, it could be the way in which you carry yourself, the way in which you shake someone's hand, whether or not you're looking them in the eye, um, whether or not you're uh, exuding confidence when you walk into a room, or it could be cultural preferences. Do you watch football on Sunday or do you, you know, do something else? So um, these things are all part of our gender expression. So sociologists have observed that this is important if we look at hegemonic masculinity because if the masculine expression is the way to move ahead in our society and to gain status, the one way that women have traditionally gained status is by emulating masculine gender expressions. So by adapting and adopting different types of mannerisms and expressions that seem masculine. Conversely, men who take on feminine expressions a lot of times tend to lose status. Um, and there are all different ways in which we can exemplify this, and we'll just talk about a few of them. So I want to talk about hegemonic masculinity in probably the easiest way to understand it. So I want to take a very quick poll. How many of the people sitting in this room today own for themselves an article of clothing that was purchased in the, uh, from the women's department of a store? So if you own an article of clothing that was purchased from the women's side of the department store. Everyone take a look around, kind of the distribution. All right, hands down. Now, how many of you own an article of clothing in your current wardrobe that was purchased in the men's side of the department store? Everybody. OK, so what's going on with that? Um, that's what we're going to talk about today, hegemonic masculinity. The idea of hegemonic masculinity is that what's good for a man is good for everyone else. Barack Obama wears suit pants. Hillary Clinton wears suit pants, right? Um, that's a masculine gender expression. Uh, female politicians tend to wear type masculine types of clothes. It exudes power, it shows and it demonstrates power. So what's good for a man is good for everyone, but what's good for a woman is only good for a woman, right? So if a male is trying to show feminine gender expression, a lot of times they're denigrated, they're brought down in status, the opposite occurs. This is the perfect example of hegemonic masculinity at work. So um, how this tends to work or how this, uh, how this tends to uh, portray in real life is that uh, we end up with these types of socialization where little girls can go dressed up as Halloween as, as cheerleaders, but if this little guy wants to go as, as a princess, you can see he's not too happy about it. Um, <laughs> He might be called names, he may, he may have to deal with these types of things. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but here's the, 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 the real kicker of it, is that because of hegemonic masculinity, men have very limited gender expressions that are accepted in society. Um, and because of that, it could be harmful. Also, women do have a larger range of gender expressions, but some of them carry more social status than others. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that now that I've laid out the theory. What I want to do is turn to my co-presenter, Preston Lowe, who's going to demonstrate the importance of hegemonic masculinity through the media that we're talking today, which is comic books. Thanks. All right, so <clears throat> why superheroes? Um, on a very superficial level, superheroes seem like this very juvenile form of entertainment. But once you delve beneath the surface of these narratives, you begin to realize that these are expressions of ideology. Uh, in this sense, they are archetypal figures that represent uh, the idealized forms of American citizens. Uh, within this framework, 
Superheroes exist as a sort of modern pantheon of American gods. Uh, whereas in classical Greek society, you would have uh, gods such as Zeus or Athena, uh, or these demigods like uh, Achilles or Heracles, who would inform Greek life, who really encapsulate Greek culture at that time. And uh, superheroes do that for us. Uh, they encapsulate all the best parts of our society. To be a superhero is to be powerful, to be brave, to be wise. Um, but it's, it's also important to understand that many issues within society manifest themselves through these narratives. Uh, issues such as racism, uh, sexism, classism, they're all present within these narratives. Um, but before I get too far into that, I would like to uh, explain how uh, these issues aren't necessarily embedded within the superhero genre, but are the uh, result of the entertainment industry at large. Um, in 2007, researchers from USC compiled a list of the top 100 grossing movies of that year, and they found that 30% of the actors with speaking roles uh, were women. 30%. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, 83% of the producers, the writers, the directors, uh, everyone involved with the production of these films were male. And that's important because just structurally, there is a denial of feminine voices, uh, of femininity itself, uh, which, and that's, that's, it's not necessarily embedded with these, uh, within the superhero genre. Um, now, as far as female representation goes within superhero narratives, uh, whether you're looking at the movies or the comic books or any other form of media, uh, the first question one must ask is, well, where are they? Uh, it's important to know that the overwhelming majority of superheroes are male. Uh, and anyone who, who keeps up with this, this genre is, is fairly aware of that. Um, perhaps another surface level observation uh, is the way in which male and female uh, heroes are portrayed aesthetically. Male figures oft are often depicted as wearing clothes that are, are, are somewhat practical. Um, Iron Man has his uh, power suit, Batman has his armor with all of his gadgets. But uh, even the most prominent female superhero, Wonder Woman, um, who in theory is just as powerful as someone like Superman, um, and equally as important as Superman, is still resigned to be half naked. Um, of course, this leads one to ask, if women are just as important and as powerful as men, why can they not wear armor that doesn't show cle uh, cleavage? Um, Recently, an organization called the Hawkeye Initiative has begun portraying male heroes in the same provocative clothing and, and poses as their female counterparts uh, to sort of bring light to the sexual double standard. And here's, here's some of that. Uh, we'll leave it there because I like that slide. Um, anyways, all that being said, I will give female characters this. Women in these narratives are able to uh, employ a wide range of abilities. Um, they're able to utilize things like their sexuality, their beauty, uh, their compassion, their wit, all of these things which go into developing a well-rounded, complex character. Um, but because of the issue of hegemonic masculinity, male heroes are fairly one-sided. Our conceptions of masculinity really disallow for any deviation away from these masculine standards. Um, our conception of masculinity incorporates many great characteristics like bravery, strength, confidence, assertiveness. Um, but because of the warped lens of hegemonic masculinity, we also uh, sort of latently value uh, somewhat antisocial traits such as aggression, violence, and uh, competition. Take, for example, Bruce Banner. Uh, Bruce Banner, also known as the Incredible Hulk, is a genius scientist. Uh, he's an intellectual, he's a complex, empathetic, caring figure, but that isn't what makes him a superhero. Bruce Banner only becomes a superhero when he transforms into the Hulk, um, this hyper-masculine, hyper-aggressive character. Another example of this would be uh, someone like Tony Stark, uh, better known as Iron Man. Uh, Tony Stark is, he's sarcastic, he's emotionally withdrawn, and uh, at many times, he's openly misogynist, uh, but he's an audience favorite. People love this character. Uh, the Iron Man franchise alone has grossed nearly $1.2 billion in ticket sales. Um, and sure, these movies are visually appealing, 
they have wonderful cinematics. I ask ourselves why we identify so heavily with the figure of Tony Stark, this billionaire misogynist playboy. Why does that figure have so much traction with us, a billionaire misogynist playboy? And if we begin to understand that, maybe we can figure out why Donald Trump is polling so well. Um, but soapbox aside, um, why does any of this matter? Um, these narratives are important because they are ultimately a vehicle for self-reflection, uh, not just as an individual, but for society to look at what we've produced and say, is this us? Or better yet, is this who we really want to be? After analyzing all of these narratives, I feel as though we need to cultivate progressive narratives, uh, which allow for men and women to deviate away from these potentially harmful uh, gender roles and be able to express themselves however they want. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a writer. I don't know the best way to convey this set of ideals, but I have, uh, I have found some incredible examples. Um, in the 1984 issue of Spider-Man and Power Pack, Spider-Man reveals that he is a survivor of childhood abuse. Um, and that's key, because there are thousands of men in our society who have experienced this kind of trauma, but are unable or unwilling to come forward about it because they're constricted, about our rigid concept, uh, they're constricted by our rigid concepts of masculinity. Um, in our society, we say things like this don't happen to men, or that they shouldn't happen to a man. Um, but here, here we have Spider-Man, one of the best, most popular characters coming, coming out and saying, yeah, I'm a survivor, but you know what? I'm still powerful. I'm still worthwhile. And most importantly, I am still a man. Uh, a progressive narrative such as this can deconstruct our societal beliefs about gender and work to cultivate a culture that is more open and accepting for everyone. Um, it's important because it's about change. Thanks, that's all I got.